Hi everyone, thank you for watching. Today I'm with Tamuka Mucha, professional boxer, uh, and he's had 18 professional fights so far, 117, and is the current Southern Area welterweight champion. And we're going to be having a chat about his life and career, but also his amazing life story and background. I hope Eddie Hen sees this interview. If if you're listening, Eddie Hen, you know, uh, please, please. Let me fight Luther Clay on one of your shows, please. You know, this kid has been talking and running his mouth and calling me out. He's called me out twice. And, you know, he's a piece of meat to me. I want to fight him. You know, I want to fight him more than I want to win the British title. You know, I want to fight whoever. Who's the British champion now? Chris Jenkins. I want to fight him more than I want to fight Chris Jenkins, Josh Kelly, Conor Ben, all of them. Because now it's about pride. Now it's about, you know... Uh, do I am I a warrior or am I scared? Do I accept a challenge or do I run away hiding? You know, I know that he had a fight with Chris Congo set up, but I'll be happy to fight Chris Congo after I take apart Luther Clay. So please, Eddie Hearn, if you're listening to this, let me fight Luther Clay. He's a piece of me and I'm just going to take him to town, you know. But, uh, you know, I have to give you a, a praise as well for, you know, for thinking outside the box and showing how great of a promoter you are and trying to put on these shows in your back garden. You know, uh, you know that, that shows that, you know, you have, uh, you know, you have amazing thing. You you know, you have amazing thought process. You can plan, you can execute, and uh, you're you're a man of many ideas, Eddie Hen. And uh, I know you would love to have me versus Luther Clay in your back garden. So let that happen, Eddie. You know, I'm ready. I'm ready. So Brilliant. that's my plan for the future. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Luther Clay first before the British title. Take apart Luther Clay and get back on mission to get in the British title. Back on. Brilliant. So thank you, Jamuka, for uh, taking the time to have a chat with me today. I appreciate that very much. So, yeah, um, let's start at the beginning then. Um, well, let's talk a bit about your background because um, and how you got into boxing. Um, so starting at the beginning, obviously, uh, coming from Zimbabwe, coming over to the UK at, at a young age um, and then getting into boxing. Let's talk a little bit about, um, about how that started. So how did you first get into boxing in the beginning? Uh, so, yeah, I, I think, um, uh, you know, my mum came to the UK first when I was about six or seven, I think. And then, like, no, 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 when I was, yeah, when I was about nine or ten, I think. And then, like, uh, we followed by. And, like, you know, I remember she left us in uh, Zimbabwe to come here to look for a better life because, you know, life in Zimbabwe was just beginning to get tough. The political uh, tension there was uh, between uh, Zimbabwe and the UK and the US were getting a bit uh, tense and, um, you know, things were definitely looking like uh, they were going to change. And, uh, you know, thanks to her. Um, you know, uh, to her anticipation of things changing, we're actually able to be in the situation that we're in today because, you know, she came here quite early back in 2002, just at the beginning of, of all those uh, political problems. And like, uh, you know, they've gotten worse over time. And like, uh, you know, people are just living, living in very difficult circumstances. So um, I'm very thankful that I'm here. And then, like, uh, yeah, I remember she left us there uh, to come here and create a better life for us, which was tough. But, you know, it was something that she needed to do because, uh, you know, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today if she hadn't done that. And, like, uh, yeah, you know, I'm very thankful to her for doing that. So, uh, yeah, I remember... Uh, she left us uh, quite young and you know I was, I was just a naughty kid man you know I was like the king of the naughty bunch and like uh, I remember I used to cause me like because she left me with my grandma and my dad and I would cause my grandma all types of havoc you know all types of nightmares I would be beating up people in the streets <laughs> fighting people slapping people just all types of naughty things and uh, come, I remember one time when I was nine I was already a tyrant by this age, you know, like, um, I remember one time I was nine, someone came to me and he was like, yo, uh, cause like we lived in quite like, a, um, uh, a developed area. It was quite in the city, but there was still a bit of, uh, undeveloped, uh, bits in the area. Uh, like I remember like being behind the new houses, the new build houses, there was like quite like, a, a, a um, like a forest jungle type area where there was like uh, bullets from the war, bombs from the war. And like, I think there'd been like the war in the 1980s and this was like the early 2000s or, or something, if I remember correctly, yeah, the early 2000s. So some of those bullets and 
grenades and bombs were still left there. And then like, I remember when someone told me like, yo, you know, we go back there, we pick up the bullets, we'll put them in a fire. They sound like firecrackers. Like I'm a nine year old, you know, every nine year old loves firecrackers, man. You know I mean? Every nine year old loves firecrackers. And, um, you know, I remember I got a bunch, I got my little crew together. I was like, okay, tell us the exact spot where we can find the bullets and the guns and the grenades. So he told us the place. And then like, these were quite the older kids. These were a bit older than us. They must've been maybe 13, 14 at the time. And we were like uh, nine, eight, 10. And then like, yeah, they're like, yeah, you go to this place. You're going to find uh, some, some bullets, some grenades, some, um, uh, what, what they call it, some shell, uh, uh, you know, uh, and like, uh, you know, you can put them in the fire and they sound like firecrackers and it's exciting. So I remember I got my little crew together. We went there. Uh, we saw like, a, a, you know, the gun thing where they put the bullets. We saw a bunch of them. So we were looking inside them and like, there weren't many bullets. And then we saw one full of bullets. And we're like, oh, yeah, we started taking the bullets out. We're like, oh, we're going to have so much fun. So I think altogether we must have had you know, more than 20 bullets. And then like, I was like, okay, let's go back uh, onto the streets, onto the main street. And, like, and, and, and light these bullets on fire. And then like, yeah, we went back onto the main street and like we set up the fire. And I remember my first thought was like, yo, let's put all 20 bullets in. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, uh, I remember someone saying to me like, nah, 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 Tom, take it easy, take it easy. Let's start with one. Let's see how it goes. But like, I, I was, you know, good thing enough, I was smart enough to listen to that guy, you know, because if I hadn't listened to that guy, a lot of people would have died because uh, we didn't know that uh, well, the other kid didn't tell us that when you put the bullets in a fire, they become live and dangerous ammunition. They actually blow up and if they hit you, you could die. So we put the bullets in a fire and then it must have blew up once, boom. And it was the most loudest sound I've ever had. And I remember running at the time like, oh, this is scary, man. And then it blew up again and then it hit me right here. I still have the scar today, you know, I know you can't, I doubt you can see it on, um, over this Zoom, but it's just under my uh, left ear, just close to the jugular vein, and it just grazed me, you know, and like, um, yeah, and it was so scary. I remember like a running, I remember like feeling like a weird feeling and then touching my neck, everyone looking at me funny, like, yo, yo, what happened to you, you know, are you okay, are you okay? I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I didn't really feel the pain at the moment, it's like, um, I think I was still in shock and then I touched my neck I was like whoa it's bleeding and everyone was like whoa you're bleeding time you've been shot you've been shot and like I remember like panicking getting scared uh I went back home uh they called my mom she came back from work I think they called an ambulance uh, the ambulance took me to because my mom's a nurse so the ambulance took me to the hospital where my mom worked and like, uh, uh, you know, they stitched me up, uh, they called the police, they called the, uh, uh, the fire uh, department, they called the army, because like, you know, that was, it became like a major event in the country. They called the newspapers, you know, and like a uh, good thing I was alive and they stitched me up, they put me back to normal. I went back home. Uh, I think I might have talked to the police uh, and then like uh, um, uh, the army came, they went into the area uh, in the next uh, week or so, they actually just started detonating um, uh, 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 grenades and um, uh, uh, you know, you know those uh, bombs that when you step on, they blow up, what are they called? Uh, landmines. Landmines, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was landmines there as well. So we were lucky that we didn't step on any of those. So they started detonating all of that. They, they, they picked up as much uh, bullets and grenades and guns as they could find. And then they kind of just cleared the area up. So in a way, it was kind of a good thing uh, that they were able to do that because like, uh, who knows, other people could have gotten hurt. So like, uh, 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 you know, it led, uh, it, sh it shown it shone a light on uh, on the situation and like um, that helped the government of the country kind of sort it out as best as they could so yeah yeah that's how that story went you know um and then like uh, i remember uh you know I, like i just started going to school and uh, things like that and then my mom was working towards bringing us here and bringing us to the uk and then like uh, she finally got settled i think around 2004 uh, she'd been applying for visas and that, but we kept getting denied. And then around 2004, 
uh, she got accepted and then like uh, 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 we were me and my brother and my dad were able to finally come here and join her which was uh, which was a great thing you know and like uh, you know to be in a country such as the UK uh, where there's so many opportunities uh, 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 you know where I could learn and develop uh, you know into them in, into the person that I want to be in the future that uh, that was definitely a, a blessing you know and like uh, yeah so now I'm here and like um yeah yeah you know i remember this time i was young i must have been six years old you know and like um yeah and there was you know the, in africa there's always political tension and things like that going on and I, I remember i think um my dad and his friends might have been protesting something that they weren't happy about and i remember they got into it with the army or the police i'm uh, you know uh, i'm not 100 percent sure who it was and um, yeah, yeah, and 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 they started firing at my dad and his friends, and they shot him in the back, you know, and he he got paralyzed, and you know that was a very devastating thing for me because like uh, you know I was always used to my dad being able to walk, and like uh, after he got shot, he got paralyzed from the waist down. Thank God, like he could still use his upper body movements and everything like that. So we, we, you know, we, we, which is still a, a blessing because to 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 today he can do most things for himself. And like uh, you know, I remember I was six years old, and then I, you know I was used to kicking ball with my dad and like uh, you know and kind of just hanging out doing things with him. And he was at home and he was like in this weird chair with wheels. And like I'm six, I'm kicking the ball at him. I'm like, yo, dad, get out of the chair, man. Like, let's kick ball. What, what, what are you sat down for? What, what are you doing? And then like, uh, you know, and it took me quite a long time until I understood like, nah, my dad was never going to walk again, you know? And like, um, you know, it was a difficult thing to come to terms to, but you know, I'm just very thankful that he's alive because the situation could have been worse. So that's the bright side of things. The fact that uh, he's still alive and he still supports me, he comes to my fights, you know? Yeah, you know, like uh, my dad is one of my top supporters and like, yeah, you know, he's usually ringside in his wheelchair, you know, screaming for me to knock the other guy out. You know? <laughs> he's always telling me to finish these guys, you know? He doesn't like the, he doesn't like it when the fights go to points, you know? Like uh, when the fights go to points, he'd be giving me a hiding back in the change room, like, yo you could have finished that guy why did you let him survive but you know like um, I'm very thankful that I still have a father you know because like um, even though he's in a wheelchair it's, you know, it's a blessing that his presence is still with me and he can support me in the fight he can encourage me and he can advise he can still do everything that a father does except um, you know except uh, walk and like uh, you know and for that I'm thankful I'm thankful well, th thank you for describing that because I, I know obviously it's, it's it's bound to be in some ways a, a painful memory, but I also understand that it is a blessing that that um, he's still with you and that life is is better now. So yeah. Okay, yeah. so let's come over to I mean, um, jumping a little bit back in time again to yeah. uh, forward in time I should say to when you're actually in the UK and you know you started. Um, Obviously, in school, you started getting into boxing and, and everything like that. I know a little bit about this, this story, yeah. but I mean, not a, a great deal. So, I mean, yeah. touching upon that, I mean, when you first walked into a gym or when you first got interested in boxing, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, what actually happened there? I mean, what sort of, um, what got you actually started in it, in the sport? Yeah, you know, I remember I must have been about 14, 13 and you know, I don't think I've ever told this bit to anyone, you know. So you'll be the you'll be getting an exclusive on this one. So there was like a girl on the bus in school days. I must I must have been at like 13, 14. And then like I wanted to kind of flirt with her, you know. And then like uh, she said, No, don't flirt with me, you're fat. And then like uh, you know, when I came to the UK, what happened is, you know, the food was so great, man. You know, in Zimbabwe, you know, we don't have just like to get to a chip shop in Zimbabwe, you have to get on two buses. You know, that's the nearest chip shop to us. So like uh, you know, when I got to the UK, all the chips and chicken shops, they're just down the street. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm getting money from my mom, I'm getting money from my dad. And like, uh, you know, every day after school, every Friday, every Saturday, every Sunday, I'm heading to your Mr. Cord, to your fish and chip shop, to your chicken and chips. You know, I'm loving it. You know what I mean? Because like in Zimbabwe, we didn't have this luxury. So like, uh, you know, I kind of indulged in the food. You know, it was cheap, it was readily available, and it was only down the streets for me so you know like I, I never had the luxury of enjoying such uh, 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 you know uh, 
you know such bad foods and 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 they and and them being so easily available so i remember i think by the time i was 14 i must have been weighing about 103 kgs you know and like uh, uh, i was fat man i was i was literally obese you know like uh, and, I, and and i think and i'm glad uh, i remember her name but i'm not gonna put her name out here uh, uh the girl but i'm glad that she did that to me because you know that kind of gave me the kick up the bum that i needed to you know like uh, to kind of start sorting myself up and I, I remember I must have been 13, 14, and that kind of hurt. That kind of hurt. But, uh, you know, after that, I wanted to go to the boxing gym and start training. And I, I remember I was looking for gyms in, uh, in Reading because uh, that's where I lived at the, uh, at the time. I, and the school I went to, uh, it was called Thames Valley at the time, but it's now called uh, John Madeski Academy. And then like, I found a local gym uh, uh, to train at. And like uh, you know, uh, and, and I joined that, and I met the coach uh, Adrian Riley, who's my coach now. You know, he was my coach throughout my amateur, and uh, he's been, uh, you know, and we just got back in touch. You know, that, that's a story we can get into a little bit above. And then like, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I started training at the gym, and I remember to help me out, there was actually a vice principal that helped me get started. His name was Mr. French. So every Friday he would uh, take us to the gym because we're that. 14, 15, so we weren't allowed to be in the gym ourselves. And I would do like 10 minutes on the treadmill just to build my fitness. So I built my fitness, built my fitness, built my fitness, went to the boxing gym, started training really hard. And I remember uh, in the gym, you know, people were looking at me, they're like, hey, man, this guy looks big, 103 kgs at 14. I must have been like, what, five foot six, five foot five. You know, I was really looking out of shape. And like, uh, people were just looking, I, felt, I just felt people looking at me like, there's no hope for this guy. But I was determined to prove them wrong, you know? I was determined to show them like, yo, nah, 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 nah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, I'm passionate about boxing, I wanna fight, and uh, uh, I wanna lose this weight. And then, like, uh, yeah, I started training. I started training, training, training. And summer came. So summer is actually what helped me because I think I must have been 15 at this time. I joined the local gym. So what I would do is I will go training in the morning and then I will go training again in the evening. And then I will check my weight the next morning. So I started training and training and training. And I think throughout that summer period, it must have been summer of 2010, if I'm not mistaken, no, no, some, no, some of 28, some of 2008, some of, the, I must have lost uh, roughly, I must have gone down from about 100 kg to about 75, you know, and I've dropped about 20, 103 to about 70, I've dropped about 28 kg, and I've gone to the coach, I'm like, yeah, I've dropped, uh, you know, I've dropped some weight, uh, can I box now? And he's like, mate, you'll be boxing at super midweight, you're like five foot five, <laughs> you gotta lose more weight. So I remember uh, the lowest I could get down to for the time being was 73. And then I, when I got down to 73, he put me in my first fight. And like I went for it. I was an animal. I must have been boxing a big, tall kid, you know. And like uh, uh, it was my first fight. I dropped him like twice. And like I, I really showed good potential in that fight. And then like, everyone was really impressed. They were like, okay, okay, that was good. But we believe that you can do better with a bit more discipline, a bit more focus. And you drop a bit more weight, get down to maybe 70, like middleweight. You know what I mean? Then the fights can start to get a bit more, a bit more fairer. Uh, okay, I was like, okay, I was determined to get the weight down. I got the weight down, boxed a few more fights. And uh, within that year, I think it must have been 2009, that's, uh, that, that, that's the year I started boxing. I won my first title, which was the, no the junior novice title. And then I was really showing good potential. So I would go, I would go sparring. I must have been 15, uh, yeah, 16, 16. So they would take me sparring. I'd be sparring with big, old people you know that are like 20 21 uh 23 and i'll be beating them up so people started calling me the beast the beast so that's where the beast came from you know so that's why when you see like in my old photos i've got like um i've got beast on my shorts because like uh people are like man this kid is a beast he's only 15 beating 20 23 year olds like with ease for fun and i was like hey yeah hey, hey. if that's what they want to call me let them call me that and like um yeah, the amateurs were a good experience, were a good experience. Yeah, okay, so I remember, uh, so after, after 10 fights, um, I won the under, uh, under 10 novices, and they gave me my first challenge. Now, there was a kid from Gloucester 
called Wayne Ingram. Now I don't know. Now Wayne Ingram was a, was a, was a highly talented kid uh, as an amateur. He won like a lot of international and national tournaments, gold medals. They were like, "Time you're ready for Wayne Ingram." I was like, uh, you think I'm ready? And they're like, yeah, you're ready for Wayne Ingram. And then like, okay, I went and fought Wayne Ingram. I put up a good fight, put up my best performance, but it just wasn't good enough. His experience and his international amateur experience was very good. And I remember going into uh, 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 the junior ABA straight after that. And then like, uh, uh, you know, like, because uh, uh, we're from the home counties, uh, I think Wayne Ingrams is from the Western counties. So before we get to the uh, uh, quarterfinals, uh, in the pre-quarters of the quarterfinals, I have to fight Wayne Ingram all the time now. So uh, it's now the pre-quarters of the a a junior ABAs. I met Wayne Ingram again. He beats me again. Another close but good contested fight. And I'm like, damn, man, this kid is good. So uh, I remember I went into the... Um, uh, CY, it must have been, was it the CYP? The C, the, yeah, it was called the CYP uh, at the time. It had another name. I, I forgot the other name that it had, but it was called the CYP Championships. Uh, what's the other name that it had? It had another name. I don't know. You'd, you'd have to look that one up. So I went into the CYPs again, and then like I met Wayne Ingram in the quarters again. I'm like, damn, this kid here, he's just that little bit better than me because of his experience. So he beats me again, but like uh, you know, I was determined to uh, uh, to showcase like you know what, I'm the best. So uh, uh, you know, ne the next year, uh, Wayne Ingram went up to mid uh, to under 75 middleweights i stayed at light middle and i didn't meet wayne ingram in the um in the uh in the quarters this time so i made it to the finals i lost to a very good kid uh, he turned professional you might know him his name damon jones he was a 2011 aba champion at, at, at welterweight yeah yeah yeah, yeah, 2000, yeah, 2011 ABA champion at welterweight. I met Damon Jones. Damon Jones was a trickster, softball, tall, easy to, I couldn't get on the inside. He beat me on point. But it was a difficult fight, you know. Um, I feel like nine, nine times out of ten, he would have probably beat me just because of his uh, athletic ability in the amateurs. And then, like, uh, so it must have been 2011 now. Uh, you know, I've shown great potential all this time and we wanted to go Olympics. The Olympics were 2012 at the time. And then my coach was like, Tam, you got talent, but, uh, you know, if you want to go Olympics, we have to go into the senior ABAs. I can't put you, this is your last year of junior ABAs, but, uh, you know, I'm going to put you in the seniors because I want you to go Olympics. And I was like, you know what, yeah, you're the coach, what you believe in, let's do it. So we went into the senior ABAs. I must have been about uh, 17, 18. Um, yeah, yeah, must have been 17 going 18. I'm knocking out all the seniors, you know. I beat two guys from the home counties in the first, in the first round. I beat another senior in the, um, uh, in the, in the pre-quarters. I beat another senior in the quarterfinals. And then uh, we got to the semifinals and I met Tom Baker. Now, what happened is between the quarters and the semis, there was like two or three weeks break. So I lost that momentum that I was that I had. I started going because I was kind of get, getting a bit of popularity around the town. I started going around chilling with girls and you know just being a lad, you know, enjoying myself. And uh, yeah, so I, you know I was with my friends and we were meeting girls and not focusing on training. You know, even though it was a break between championship, I should have really been focusing on winning the ABA. And then, like, uh, you know, if it finally came to the week of the fight, I jump on the scales. I must have been, what, 75, and I needed to be 69. I lost all the weight within that week. Uh, I went into the, into the semifinals of the senior ABAs, and I put up a good fight. I put up a good first round. I was competitive. Second round, that weight drain was kind of getting to me, and Tom Baker was, put, you know, it was really becoming a difficult rivalry. And by the third round, I, you know, I... I I knew that, you know, my performance wasn't good enough. Tom Baker had taken over and I'd lost. And like, everyone was like, ah, you know, Tom, you could have done better, all, all, all of that. But I knew within myself that, you know, if I had stayed disciplined, if I had stayed focused, if I had stayed dedicated as I should have, I could have won the uh, senior ABAs that year, but I didn't. So what I did the next year, I dropped down to welterweight and I got really dedicated. You know, I, you know, I'm no girls this time, no partying, no messing about. So from September 
2011 to about I don't know uh, 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 April 2012, I was get I was locked in. I was focused on winning the senior ABAs, and um, you know I went into the championships. I was beating everyone with ease. Uh, met a kid called um, from London, um, Georgie King. Georgie King, you know, very good boxer. I think he got signed to Fan Quarren after, you know, but I never did much in the pros. But it was a good amateur, well known name, big fan base. You know, we get to the uh, quarterfinals. And, um, you know, his fan base is cheering. I'm like, whoa, this kid's brought a massive fan base. But I was determined to win the ABAs that year. I had locked myself in, no girls this time. And uh, I, I remember just going, taking him apart, you know, as an animal. And uh, I won the fight, unanimous decision. And uh, by now, I mean, I'm becoming a real threat in the world away division. People could see that, you know, I have real potential to win this tournament. Uh, I went into the semis. Uh, boxed the kid, uh, and I forgot forgot his name. Uh, I stopped him in the semi-finals, and then like, I went into the finals. I boxed Lewis Ritson, you know, who's the current uh, European champion, very good fighter. And like uh, you know, I didn't know much about Lewis Ritson. You know, I, I looked him up on uh, 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 on the um, Warrior Boxing they had uh, back in those days, and like he didn't want much of anything, you know. Uh, of, you know, uh, but he had like you know, it seemed like he had beaten some good names. Uh, I think he beat like a guy called Jeff Saunders or something like that, who's also a good fighter. So I, you know, I, you know, I, I knew that he was, was going to be a tough fight, but you know, I knew I had the skills to beat him. And not the and the work rate, you know. And uh, I remember that fight was a back and forth war. Me and Lewis Richardson were going at it in the middle of the ring, but my work rate and my skills were just that little bit better than him. And, um, you know, I remember just taking every each issue. Yeah, the rounds were close, but I just took every round. I took first, second, and third round. And uh, I won. I finally became ABA champion uh, in three rounds, unanimous decision. You know, I finally achieved the dream. You know, it wasn't Olympics, but it was a big goal of mine. I wanted to, you know, to become ABA champion so much. And then, like, uh, 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 so I got, I got the call up from GB Boxing. Uh, or, um, or, or England boxing to, uh, for the tryouts. Uh, we went on the tryouts, met all the guys there. It was nice sparring and training with everyone. It was an amazing time. Joe Joyce was there, uh, Robbie Davis, uh, met, uh, he was there. And I think I, I banked with Joe Joyce at the time. You know, I remember him teaching me how to shave because I was so young, I didn't even know how to shave. You know, I, so like uh, they said, look, if you're going to be boxing in the championships, uh, you need to shave your beard. I was like, what? Shave? I've never shaved in my life. I'm like 18, 19, you know, like uh, how do I do it? And then like Joe Joyce kind of taught me how to do it because we banked together. And then like, I, so I shaved and then, I, you know, I, I remember the next day, the first fight, I was boxing a kid called Stuart Burt from Scotland. He was the ABA champion from Scotland. I think by this time, Ireland were out of the UK. So Ireland were no longer part of the uh, GB setup. So it was England, uh, Scotland and GB, you know, so we'd have to box each other for the chance to, uh, you know, uh, to go, you know, to be cut, to get, you know, to become number one GB boxer. And uh, I boxed you up, but took him apart with ease, you know, it was an easy fight, dominated that fight, you know, I must have won 40 points to 20 something, uh, I gave him a count, all of that. And I remember the next day I'm facing Anthony Fowler. Now, uh, you know, I forgot to mention this, but when, before I started uh, boxing, like this must have been back in 2008, 2009, uh, Anthony Fowler was already a big name in boxing. And I remember watching a kid from my gym called Edmond Duraco in, a, um, in the GB Championships. And like uh, 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 Anthony Fowler was uh, boxing in that championships as well. And I remember like being in, oh, like, whoa, who is this guy? He was knocking people out. You know, he was amazing. I think it was like uh, Anthony Fowler as an amateur, he was just a powerful kid, you know, beating up everyone. And I was like, whoa, who is, he's amazing. I, so I started looking up to Fowler at that time. So now we're talking, well, I started boxing in 2009 and now it's 2012, three years later, you know, and across from me is the guy that I look up to. You know what I mean? It's the guy that I've always admired. I wanted to be like, and I couldn't believe that, you know, I'm fighting Anthony Fowler, you know, uh, you know, as much as I wanted to win, 
I had so much respect for him. I had so much respect for his power, for what he had achieved. That I never really went into that fight with the mentality that I would have against, uh, you know, any other boxer, you know, because like this was someone that I look up to, someone that I'm in all of, you know, and like uh, I boxed well in the uh, in in the final, the GB, but you know, like I felt like I gave Anthony Fowler too much respect. And like, uh, you know, I lost on points and like, um, you know, it was a good performance, but it could have been better had I not respected him as much as I did. But, you know, that's a lesson for the future. And uh, yeah, he beat me by, yeah, he beat me on points. He beat me on points. It was, a, you know, it was a good fight. And then like, uh, uh, you know, so afterwards, uh, I remember, you know, there were opportunities to turn pro. And I remember uh, Chris Saniger. Uh, who was Lee Selby's manager at the time, had approached me and given me his card about turning pro with him. And I come, and I, and, I, and I thought, you know what, yeah, and my coach thought, you know, now is the time to turn pro time. You know, you're ready for the professional game. Uh, 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 let's go and talk to Chris and uh, sign, uh, sign a deal. So we went over to Bristol, uh, talked to Chris Saniga. I remember uh, for the preparation for the ABA, for the senior ABAs of 2012, I was sparring Lee Selby uh, and Mitch Buckland. And like, uh, you know, they helped me a lot during training. And uh, Lee Selby must have been British and Commonwealth at this time. And uh, Gary Buckland was also British and Commonwealth champion. So, you know, it was great experience sparring those guys. And like Lee Selby is quite like a big featherweight because I think at the time he used to walk around light welter. So he would walk around 65 kgs and then strip himself down to 56 or whatever. You know, he was one of the biggest uh, uh, featherweights in the, in the world. And so it was a great experience sparring him. Good, learned a lot, you know, helped develop. So I knew that our signing with Chris Saniga was going to be a very good option because he'd guided so many fighters to the top you know Glenn Cutley uh, uh, Dean Francis and uh, um, and Lee Selby so uh, you know we signed a deal uh, we started having fights uh, under under professional fights under Sandica and he was looking after me well he even took me to to uh, LA at, at one point, um, met Freddie Roach, met Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, um, Tommy Hens. Uh, you know, uh, I can't think of any other fighters, but met some quite, you know, quite a few uh, big names in the boxing game. And um, yeah, um, yeah, I remember. So yeah, uh, what happened after that? So yeah, we signed with him, and then like, um, you know, I had about four or five fights, and uh, you know, unfortunately, I was young. I was young and gullible. I was young and gullible. So, you know, I listened to the wrong people and I, can't, I ended up splitting with my coach, uh, you know, which wasn't smart on my side, but, you know, I'm a 20 year old. I was getting impressed by material things and, uh, you know, uh, and I didn't listen to my coach and like, I should have listened to my coach. And that created a rift between us because I wasn't listening now. And to Trevor Francis, who's uh, the father of Dean Francis, he trained uh, Dean Francis to become European champion. And I started training with him, you know? And uh, you know, I learned so much of him. I learned uh, footwork, moves in the jab, uh, slipping shots. I became, because like most, throughout most of my amateur career, I was quite an aggressive fighter. You know what I mean? Like people my work rate and aggressiveness and just going out there and taking people apart and when it went to Trev he slowed me down a bit he turned me into a bit of a boxer boxer puncher I started using my boxing ability a lot more started using my jab started using footwork uh you know uh, which quite we showed case which I was able to showcase in the Paddy Gallagher fight uh, uh you know that was uh, a lot of uh, Trevor Francis's training and I uh, won many fights under him uh, I got the opportunity to fight Eric Ochin for the uh, uh, Southern Area uh, title under a matchroom show. This was the, first, uh, the second time we were going to get Eddie Hearn to have a look at me. And I boxed Eric Ochin and I beat him up. You know, I stopped him in the sixth round. You know, it was one of my best performances. And I remember really just going out there. I was, you know, I was at my best uh, that day. And... Um, you know, uh, and I, you know, I want to give because uh, I'm a, quite a man of faith myself. So I want to give thanks to God for that. So I remember uh, boxing Eric coaching on a matchroom show. Eddie Hearn uh, or was uh, was the promoter, and uh, I dazed him in the second round. I hit him with 50 punches. They should have stopped the fight at this time, you know, but they didn't because he was the A side and I was the B side. So they were protecting him. And uh, and I looked at the ref. I was like, look, I understand he's the A side. 
and you have to protect him. But, you know, uh, I'm here to do a job. But as a fighter, my job is to win. And as the referee, your job is to protect uh, uh, the fighter, make sure that, you know, he goes back home to his family. And, like, uh, he didn't, you know, like, he didn't do anything. So, uh, I, you know, kept boxing, kept fighting, kept hurting, him, very deadly left hook. And, like, uh, I remember at this time, the ref jumped straight in and stopped the fight. And I'm very thankful he did that because, you know, you don't want to let any fighter take any too much punishment. I wouldn't want that to happen to me. If I'm taking too much punishment, you know, I would hope the ref would do his job because sometimes the corner may be hesitant to, uh, to throw the towel in. And sometimes fighters such as myself, you know, I'm a warrior, you know, I'm going to fight to the end. Uh, I don't know what's good for me when I'm in that ring, you know, I, I'm willing to, you know, I'm willing to fight until I'm on my last legs. So, you know, I'm going to keep throwing. So I would hope the referee would do oh, do a job if I was ever in that situation. The ref finally uh, stepped in, stopped the fight, which was great. And then like, um, yeah, so afterwards, I didn't get the call up to join the matching team, but um. You know, I remember a few months after that, there was a kid called Tommy Tear, and uh, you know, I accepted the challenge. Uh, it was a voluntary defense, and uh, you know, I, you know, I went uh, uh, fought Tommy Tear at the York Hall. Uh, the fight went, uh, you know, it went on. Uh, it went on points. It was a, it was a um, ten round decision. Uh, in easy fight, you know, I, I dominated that fight. I did a great job, and then uh, after the Tommy Tear fight, I think I had one more fight. Uh, uh, in between and then like uh, you know I remember my manager at the time Chris Saniga, um he called me he's like yo Tom I want you to fight in the British title eliminator against uh, a kid from Ireland Paddy Gallagher you know but uh, you know uh, before you fight Paddy Gallagher uh, why don't you come and have a look at him so I remember going to have a look at him fight a kid called Tony Dixon now that fight lasted two rounds Paddy Gallagher hit him with a deadly right hand and that kid crumbled and that uh, me and Tommy uh, me and Tony Dixon were from the same camp so we used to spar together because he was signed to Chris Sanigay as well and uh, yeah he fell apart he got hit with a big shot and the knock the knockout was devastating I remember looking at my brother at the time and I was like yo I'm gonna fight this kid I want to fight this kid because I believe I can beat him. And like a few months later, I think it must have been six, seven months later, the fight's made. You know, uh, it's going to be on, it was going to be on a George Groves undercard at Wembley. And uh, yeah, you know, it was a big opportunity for me. First time on TV, uh, uh, on a massive show. I think there must have been a thousand fans at this show. And like, you know, we did a lot to promote it. And um, yeah, so we went to Wembley. And like I learned, like this is where the boxing that I learned from Trevor Francis came into effect, because Paddy Gallagher, I knew he was going to be dangerous early on in the fight. I was with him, and then like I think for the first three, four rounds, I'm boxing, I'm on, I'm moving quite well, you know, I'm slipping shots, but it hurt me a couple of times, you know, dazed me a couple of times, you know, got myself, gathered myself, got myself back in it. And I remember around fourth, fifth round, I was like, okay, it's time to get stuck in now. I need to show people that, you know, I'm not so around fourth, fifth round, I, I changed my game plan. I stopped boxing, stood in the middle of the ring, started fighting him, started pushing him back, started hitting him with shots. You know, started my work rate, well, he couldn't match my work rate. You know, my work rate uh, was above and beyond anything that he expected. I'm outworking him, out jabbing him, out. I just outworking. I'm just dominating this fight, and um, you know, it got to the tenth round, and uh, you know, I knew that it was still dangerous, uh, so I went back to what I was doing early on in the fight. I started re, I started boxing again. I was like, you know, it's the tenth round. He knows he's down in the scorecards. I, sometimes you could be wrong. Sometimes you could be right. But I didn't think it was worth me risking getting knocked out in the tenth round. So I started boxing in the 10th round, boxed really well, you know, dominate. I think I won that round as well. And then it went to decision. And then, like, uh, you know, uh, he scored, uh, you know, they were, they were announcing uh, uh, the scorecards. Uh, uh, you know, they were like, okay, 116, uh, 113 for Tamoka Mocha. I'm like, okay, that sounds right. And then they must have said 112, 112 for draw by Howard Foster, and I was like, mm, that doesn't sound right to me, but okay, let's see what the third judge says. And the chair, third judge said the same as the first, 116, 113, Tamoka Mucha, by, uh, um, I think, a majority decision. I took that fight. So now I'm excited, you know, I'm excited. I'm walking around Reading Town like the men, you know, people asking for pictures and autographs, you know, girls are coming out of the woodworks, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I felt like the men and I was the man at the time. And like, um, yeah, uh, 
So I was meant to fight. Uh, so they set the fight up of Rob Hunt and then I, I got my medicals done early, which was my fault. I was supposed to have my medicals done early on. So I got my medicals done in the week of the fight and they thought there might have been a problem with my eyes. So they were like, look, you have to get a, 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 another eye test by an ophthalmologist. So we went to the ophthalmologist, you know, maybe they, there wasn't an adverse fi- finding in your eye. Uh, everything looks fine. Uh, we sent that, that back to the board, but it was too late. It wasn't The fight was on Saturday and I was trying to get the medicals done on Thursday, Friday. And it was too late. The, the doctors can't look at your medicals. Uh, you're going to have to cancel this fight. Unfortunately, I can't, we had to cancel the fight, which was an unfortunate uh, uh, thing. And then, like, uh, you know, Rob Hunt is a six foot something guy. He's a six foot welterweight, one of the tallest welterweight in the country. And then, like, straight after that, I think three weeks later, you know, like, uh, the, for a week, I didn't really know what was happening. So for a week, you know, I was just kind of, I was in training. I was kind of in a bad mood. I was eating rubbish. I was like, ah, oh, that whole camp went to waste, wasted money, wasted time, wasted effort. And then like, uh, you know, I just remember just being in a low mood. And uh, yeah, so they were like, okay, Tom, uh, Chris and I came to me and like, Tom, I'll got you another fight uh, in two weeks time, in two, three weeks time, start getting ready. So obviously I start getting ready. Uh, uh, I start getting myself, you know, in shape. Uh, but you know, I I wasn't as motivated as I was before. I was still not in the best mood. But I'm training as best as I can. And then it comes to uh, I think it came to fight week. Uh, you know, I was fighting Surgeon Bomb. We had weighing on the day, and like uh, you know, because I didn't really train to my best ability. I didn't make weight the right way. Went to the weighing, uh, weighed in. Uh, you know, made uh, I was a little bit higher than I should have been. Uh, uh, yeah, I remember they set up the fight. Uh, so you know, a couple of hours later, I'm in the ring with Sergio Bomo. Now Sergio Bomo looked. Uh, you know, I knew about Sergio Bomo because like um, he had uh, uh, ended one. Uh, what, what, uh, he had ended the boxer's career before. You know, I forgot uh, the name exactly, but I hit him with his with a shot so hard the guy went into a coma for a few weeks, and he had to like had a brain surgery. So I knew like you know this is not a guy to underestimate. So during the fight, I'm boxing well, I'm boxing well. I think I took the first round, took the second round, I drop him in the third. I'm like, okay, everything seems to go in according to plan. He comes back in the fourth, he hits me with a shot, he dazes me. You know, we kind of start scrambling and then I end up on the ground. I didn't really think it was a knockdown, but, I, you know, because the, uh, the ref called it a knockdown because I thought he pushed me to the ground. But I was hurt by the shot, but I was trying to grapple with him and then he dashed me to the ground and the ref called it a knockdown. Counted, hit me with a few shots. And then from that point, the fight turned. You know, that was a turning point of the fight. And I think he might have took the sixth and the seventh, um, you know, the fifth and the sixth round. And then it went to decision. And then, uh, yeah, I remember uh, the fight must have been, uh, uh, I lost by one point. Must have been 59, 58 or something like that. And man, I was devastated because this was just, you know, this I was on the brink of a British final eliminator. And now I've lost to this guy, Sergio Bomo. You know, I didn't really understand what was going to happen. But, you know, uh, 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 uh. You know, I thank God because Chris Sanniger, the good manager he is, uh, he managed to talk to the board. You know, he went to the board. He's like, look, Sergio Bomo is from Africa. He's not even British. So him losing to Sergio Bomo shouldn't really uh, uh, mess up the opportunities for him to fight for the British title. He's still in line for a British final eliminator. And thank God I was. So the board understood that and they put me in the British final eliminator. And then, like, uh, you know, it was going to be against John O'Donnell. Now, John O'Donnell was a nightmare, mate. Do you know the story of John O'Donnell? A little bit, yeah, but I, yeah. I do. But for, carry on for the purpose yeah. of this, but I know. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm going to let everyone know. But the John O'Donnell situation was a nightmare. He pulled out on me three times. I've never had that in my life. Like, you have to realise, yeah, as fighters, we get paid from fighting. You know, and like, um, you know, I didn't really have that many sponsors. I had one sponsor at the time, Jim Flooring, a great company. They looked after me for a long time, looked after me well. And like, uh, you know, they were my main source of income outside of boxing. And I was kind of doing personal trainings here and there. And um, 
yeah, we set up the fight with John O'Donnell the first time. You know, uh, it's on a small, sh uh, I think like it's on an O2 Arena Indigo and we're supposed to headline that show uh, uh, or, or co-main event with Joe Joyce. And then like uh, he pulls out, I'm um, like, okay, I'm like, okay, these things happen. It's the first time fighters pull out, people get injured. So we set the fight up again. Uh, a few months down the line, I think two, three months down the line, we set the fight up. I get into another camp. I'm training. I'm spending money on training camp, you know, all of that. He pulls out a second time. Now I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, I, I haven't been paid in almost six, seven months. You know, I'm surviving of sponsors and personal training. I know. And this is the British final eliminator. I win this fight. I get a shot at Bradley Skip. And I believed I could beat Bradley Ski, who was the British champion at the time. And then, like, uh, we get into a third fight. You know, we get into a third fight. And I'm like, okay, surely this time is going to turn up. You know, the, like, it's the third time. Who pulls out of a fight three times in a row? No one I've ever heard do that in my life. And then, like, it comes to must have been two weeks before the fight. I hear that John O'Donnell is not going to turn up, mate. And then I must have went on a rampage on IFL TV and I'm calling him out. I'm threatening to send my mom to his house. All of this, all of that. Uh, you know, I was really on one, mate. I was really on one. I was frustrated. I was frustrated. You know, you know, I, I've got no money. I'm running out of money. Uh, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm spending all this money in training camps. Nothing's coming together. And then like, um, you know, uh, he pulls out. And they're like, okay, don't worry that John O'Donnell is pulled out. We're going to put Freddie Kiwit in. And I, can't, you know, and I thought, okay, like, I can fight Freddie Kiwit. So I start training. It must have been two weeks before the fight. But I wasn't feeling well. I think like, the pull out, the stress was just kind of causing me a lot of anxiety and a mental pain. And I, you know, I just wasn't feeling well. I remember kind of you know, just, just like not being at my best. And uh, I called my manager. I'm like, look, I can't fight Freddie Kiewit, man. First off, you know, Freddie Kiewit and John, Freddie Kiewit is a dangerous fighter. You know, he's not a fighter that you want to fight with two weeks preparation. And, uh, you know, uh, and he's orthodox. So John O'Donnell is Southpaw. So I've been preparing for Southpaw throughout this whole camp. And then two weeks before the fight, he wanted me to fight a dangerous orthodox fighter. So and I remember not feeling well. I went to my, uh, to my uh, coach at the time, and my manager. I rang Chris Sanigar. I was like, you know what, yeah, uh, I'm pulling out of this fight. I'm not feeling well. And they understood. And like, uh, you know, I pulled out the fight. But I was still unhappy with Chris Sanigar because, you know, he lost the purse bids. Uh, between me and John O'Donnell to host the uh, final eliminator. So because he lost the purse bids, we couldn't, um, we couldn't uh, 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 schedule the fights the way that we wanted to schedule them. So every time he pulled out, they weren't, putting me, they weren't keeping me on the show because they had won the purse bids, they would kick me off the show entirely. You know, they wouldn't let me fight on. So they kicked me off. Um, so I was angry with Sonny Gert at that time and my contract with him was coming to an end. And uh, I decided not to renew. You know, uh, I decided not to renew with uh, Chris Saniga, and uh, uh, you know, I, I went and I signed with um, uh, Andy Ailing, uh, who's also works with Frank Warren. So now I was under Frank Warren management, which is uh, which is also another good uh, team, another good company. Um, tried to, we tried to set up fights. Uh, you know, but someone uh, like Andy Ailing is coming back to me. It's like, time, no one wants to fight you at the moment because, you know, you got 17 fights, 16 wins. You are uh, too high risk, low reward at the moment. You know, you've got nothing to offer. You've got no titles. Uh, you've got no, you know, you have your name isn't as big as, you know, uh, it doesn't make it worth it to fight you. Uh, so, you know, I remember just feeling devastated and like, um, uh, uh, we, we set up a fight, uh, which was great. And then I, I got to the arena, and then like uh, I was supposed to fight that night, and uh, 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 because the show was overpacked, my fight was the only one to get cancelled. And I remember just being devastated. Like this was just a run of bad luck. This must have been over like you know a, a year of bad luck. So I signed to Dave Caldwell. Uh, I'm with him now, and uh, uh, no, no. Before I signed to Dev Caldwell, I had a fight. Uh, a guy called um, Charlie Oliver from uh, 
uh, from Cumberly. He put me on one of his shows and uh, I had a fight on the show and uh, I won uh, against, against a kid called Fernando Valencia. It was just a, you know, a, a kid busy fight, a get back into action type fight. This you know, it's because it had been roughly about two years since I'd fought. And then I got, I won that fight. Uh, you know, uh, what happened? Yeah, so I won that fight, and then like, uh, uh, you know, I decided to terminate my uh, my contract with uh, Andy Ailing and Frank Warren, and I signed with uh, Dave Caldwell, which you know he's a great manager. You know, if you know anything about Dave Caldwell, you know he's achieved some great things through Tony Bellew. Uh, he's worked with some great fighters. He's worked with Anthony Fowler. Uh, it was also a good chance for him when I went to sign with uh, Dave Kodo to bump into Anthony Fowler, an old rival, you know, now under the same uh, uh, boxing uh, team, uh, boxing camp, you know. Um, so I signed with Dave Caldwell. Uh, I went to, um, yeah, uh, so we, I'm, I'm still under Dave Caldwell. I haven't fought under Dave Caldwell as of yet because of everything that's going on with covid and uh, uh, you know a few complications, but uh, you know I'm looking forward to um, you know to boxing under him. You know, what's what's the aim from here? What's the future plan? Because I know the British title is obviously mm. you know it's still on your mind a lot, yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. and everything. And I know you said before that the end goal um, yeah. has got to be obviously um, the world title. But okay. I mean between here and there, I mean what you know what are you aiming for? right now as of as of now i mean after covid's over and lockdown gets lifted and, and everything like that what's the what's sort of on your mind like what's next basically uh you know what yeah so obviously because of covid everything has just been unpredictable and uh, one of the fights i've always wanted was a josh kelly fight you know I, I you know i see a lot of hype around him but i'm just not convinced i feel like i can take him apart you know i see a lot of holes that i can take apart in josh kelly you know and uh you know i see Conor ben's getting his name out there but I'm just not convinced about Conor Benny. He hasn't fought anyone with a spine as of yet. I don't know why he's ranked like top five in box rank or whatever. You know, you have to give it to Matcham. You know, they're a great management company and they've done a great uh, job of uh, managing and uh, getting him out. And, you know, he's managed to get to top five in the country without fighting anyone with a spine. I feel like, you know, he's kind of, He's you know he's rolled uh, the hype off of his dad's name and it's gotten him to where he is. But you know uh, he has to get tested now. You know it's been like three four years since he's been a pro. You know and like uh, you know I feel like you know it's only fair that you put him in a real test so that we can find out if he's really got the goods or if he's really about this you know this boxing life if he's got what it takes to become a champion. So I know I remember I was on Facebook. Uh, in, in Instagram and Twitter um, uh, and call it, no, I was just angry and I, and I was like, you know what, yeah, I want to fight these guys, I want to fight Conor Ben and Josh Kelly, I'm just going on a run and then like, as I'm going on a run you know, uh, I see uh, uh, I don't know, you know, a fighter called Luther Clay? Yeah, I know him, yeah so, Yeah, when I fought Fernando Valencia, Luther Clay beat he my, beat my called O'Shane Clark and after he beat O'Shane Clark, he called me out uh, by name, he's like, yo, Tamuka Mucha, I want to fight you next. I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 okay, okay. We used to spar together, we used to train together. I thought we were cool. But if you're calling me out, I'm ready to oblige. I'm a warrior. You get me? I'm a fighter. I'll fight, I'll take you apart. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, that was my mindset at the time. But I remember the team I was with at the time were like, ah, Tom, there's just no profit in you fighting Luther. Rah, rah, rah. He doesn't even have a, um, doesn't even have a British license. So even if you beat him, you're not gonna get far in the British rankings. It's a high risk. Uh, 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 it's no, I don't even consider it a high risk. But they thought it was a high risk, low reward fight. But for me, I just thought, you know what, yeah, it's an easy, easy fight. Luther is just a piece of meat to me, you know what I mean? It's just me going out there to eat, me, you know? It's like, a, it's like, because like, I haven't fought a competitive fight in over two years. I was like, you know, feed me Luther, you know what I mean? Like, a, I'm just going to go out there and devour him, you know? It's like, you know, like a lion when he hasn't been fed and they chuck some meat at him. That's what me fighting Luther is. That's just that lion going to town on that piece of meat. You get me? So I was happy to oblige, but the team were like, yeah, let's hold off on it. So I've sent out this uh, tweets and uh, Instagram posts calling out Conor Ben and Josh Kelly. And I see in the comments, I see Luther Clay and his team. They're talking about fighting me. I'm like, yo, this is the second time you've called my name. 
Now I'm more than happy to oblige because first of all, you beat my friend from Reading and you disrespected Reading town after you beat my friend. You know what, yeah? I want to, and you've called me out twice. You're making this person. Let's do it. You're a piece of meat and I'm going to eat. You get me? I want to eat. I'm a lion that hasn't been fed, you know, a top con a competitive fight in over two years. And Luther, you calling me out. And now that you've built a bit of a name, you've beat Freddie Kiewit, you know, on Sky Sports. Uh, you've beat, uh, I think I had beat some Italian guy on Sky Sports. You're building it. You're worthy of me accepting this challenge now. You're worthy of me devouring you. So, I, you know, I accepted that fight. Uh, 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 and his team, uh, they want that fight. So we've been going back and forth on it. I've been putting out posts, letting Eddie Hearn know that, you know what, yeah, I want this fight. You know, I, I'm ready to fight Luther. So that's what I want for the future. And I have to give it to Eddie Hearn, you know. Um, uh, you know, you have to give it to his ability to, you know, to to plan, to organize, uh, you know, to think, because I see he's planning to put on shows in his back garden. And, you know, I just think it would be a great idea if Eddie Hearn can put me and Luther on that show. You know, Luther, I will take him apart. I will go to town on this kid. You know, I will put on a performance. People are going to see the uh, Tamoka Mocha that stopped Eric Hoche in that night. They're going to see the animal in me. They're going to see how hungry I am, you know, how hungry I am to get back to the top. And, um, you know, I'm happy to oblige. I'm happy. So, you know, I hope Eddie Hen sees this interview. If, if you're listening, Eddie Hen, you know, uh, please, please let me fight Luther Clay on one of your shows. Please. You know, this kid has been talking and running his mouth and calling me out. He's called me out twice. And, you know, he's a piece of meat to me. I want to fight him. You know, I want to fight him more than I want to win the British title. You know, I want to whoever who's the British champion now, Chris Jenkins. I want to fight him more than I want to fight Chris Jenkins, Josh Kelly, Connor Ben, all of them. Because now it's about pride. Now it's about, you know, uh, do I, am I a warrior or am I scared? Do I accept the challenge or do I run away hiding? You know, I know that he had a fight with Chris Congo set up, but I'll be happy to fight Chris Congo after I take apart Luther Clay. So please, Eddie Hearn, if you're listening to this, let me fight Luther Clay. He's a piece of me, and I'm just going to take him to town, you know. But, uh, you know, I have to give you a, a praise as well for, you know, for thinking outside the box and showing how great of a promoter you are and trying to put on these shows in your back garden. You know, uh, you know that, that shows that, you know, you have, uh, you know you have amazing thing you you know you have amazing thought process you can plan you can execute and uh, you're you're a man of many ideas Eddie Hen and uh, I know you would love to have me versus Luther Clay in your back garden so let that happen Eddie you know I'm ready I'm ready so Brilliant. that's my plan for the future okay Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Luther Clay first before the British title take okay. apart Luther Clay and get back on mission to get in the British title back on Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, you got you got a clear plan there. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's everything, really, champ. We, we you know, we've covered some really good material, and it's, it's a nice insight because it shows obviously where you've come from, how you got there, challenges you've overcome, yeah. and the success yeah. so far, and then obviously where you're going from here. So it's a, it's, yeah. it's a good step by step. One more thing I want to add. You know, I've been using our VR training which has been quite great, you know, like I put on uh, the Oculus uh, VR and, uh, you know, I've been playing uh, Thriller the Fight and it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a good game and it's been helping me stay fit and stay in shape during this time. So, you know, I recommend it for all the people out there that want to do social distance training. Uh, just put on your VR, you know, VR goggles and, and uh, the VR kit and get in, and, you know, and, 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 and start boxing some people online. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, uh, that this COVID thing ends soon and uh, we can get back uh, to normal and get back to the way things were. But um, during this time, you know, if, if people are missing training, if uh, they're missing the excitement of being in the boxing ring, VR training is the way to go. So, you know, I recommend that everyone out there go out there and uh, use some uh, VR Oculus. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good game. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.